Great. So uh, welcome, everybody, um, to uh, today's uh, guest speaker. We have Dr. David Carr, who is a Western EM grad, uh, sadly in Coombs here. Don't hold it against him, please. Um, so what I'd like to say is, uh, you know, Dave is an associate professor in the division of EM um, at U of T. He's an eMERGE physician and clinical investigation at UHN and McKenzie Health. He's involved in a lot of things. So continuing uh, professional development lead in the tri-medicine, uh, sorry, tri-division of EM at the U of T. And he's had loads and loads of uh, undergraduate and postgraduate clinical teaching awards. Uh, during the baseball season more recently, he now works at the Rogers Center as the medical director of stadium medicine for the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, in 2010, he pursued his passion serving as an ER physician in the Athletes Visit Village for the Winter Olympics in Vancouver. Uh, since 2010, he's co-authored the chapter on occlusive arterial disease in uh, Tintin Alley's emergency medicine. Um, last time I saw Dave, as he reminded me, it was way back at Cape in Newfoundland, which is probably about 10 years ago, uh, which has been far too long. Um, but anyway, welcome, David. Really glad that you're able to join us today. Um, I will be moderating the chat room. So if you guys have questions, please pop them up on the chat room. Um, we can hit them in real time or we'll have lots of room for discussion towards the end. Um, David tells me this will take about 35 to 40 minutes or so to chat. But really what he's gonna tell us is how to avoid patient complaints and lawsuits. So how to stay out of trouble. All right, go ahead, Dave. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. It, it's it's amazing how years fly by. Um, to contextualize who I am, um, I went to Western about 18 years ago. 18 years ago was a time where Dr. Grant Coombe was my colleague and we were residents in London. Um, Laura and Terry were just becoming new staff. Terry and Derek used to like to golf. I'm not sure if they still like to golf. Um, Sammy Slovaki was transitioning to the Bearcat, and that was a great place to eat. Um, Adam Ducolo and Ian Ball were PGY2s, and Rob Arnfeld and Mike Peddle were PGY1. So that's who I am. And it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces on the chat and the pictures, because these are lots of people I'd like to see. And what I would say about London, and I tell this to all the residents, is if you want the best place to train, it's Western. There is no doubt in my mind that you have historically and continue to train amazing people. It's such a wonderful program and such a, a great honor to be here. So it really sucks that we're talking about bad things. No one really likes patient complaints and medical legal stuff, especially during COVID. So what I'm hoping you'll do today is at least step back, rewind 14 months and think about the way medicine once was because it's going to come back all pandemics end, and this will end so then we'll have to deal with some of the fallout so the issue is why is it me here why am i the one doing this so i hear patient complaints and lawsuits for a living so my kind of trajectory was i started doing risk management at uhn where i dealt with about two to three complaints a year for 10 years so i did that role and i got to learn the craft i got to see where people screw up and what i can tell you and, and we'll go into this further is that super nice people don't get a lot of complaints as i recall a doc like Kelly Regan, she was wonderful she's not going to get a ton of complaints but we can all look around in the department and say who's gonna get complaints. And lawsuits are a different thing. And I'll tell you about medical legal stuff. I've done about 225 reviews and I started mostly working for the CMPA and I do quite a lot of work um, for all the four or five firms, do a lot of work in London with learners. And then about a year ago, the CMPA started um, farming me out to plaintiff work because I was too focused on defending physicians. And now I would say that I do about half of my work doing plaintiff work, half of my work doing defendant work. So I kind of get a sense of where we go wrong. And what I want to do today is just talk to you about patient complaints, how to avoid them, and talk to you about medical legal pearls, the, what I've learned, where things happen. And when I review a file, what I look for to make sure you're not getting in trouble. Okay. And I think when we graduated, when I graduated so many years ago, this magazine used to be a magazine that you'd kind of, when you're in the bathroom, you'd look at it just to see if any of your colleagues got into trouble that you went to med school with. Now, 
if you read Dialogue, you'll see that it is a huge lineup just to get in. Like you had to submit to Dialogue your complaint, but you won't get published for like six months. Like it's a full chart. More and more people are doing wrong and getting caught. So we got to keep you out of trouble. And most of the stuff that goes in dialogue isn't the stuff that gets to the patient complaint. Let's, let's be very clear. Those are, for the most part, professionalism, criminal, fraudulent stuff. Let's talk more on a micro level and let's talk about complaints. And probably the reason why the milieu is so poor is the weight. And really, when you look at people who stay in our departments for more than 24 hours, their mortality is increased by three times. I'm sure you have people who are boarding. When you look at patients who enter a system that is defined as overcrowded, which is basically every day, we have a 5 to 10% increased mortality. So what you can figure and garner from that is it is a perfect storm for badness to happen, be it for patient's perception and for patient's outcome. And this is not made up. And you have to realize through the patient's lens what their life is like. I mean, emergency medicine has become like a hot restaurant or bakery where you have to take a number and you wait. And sometimes you wait so long to even register. And for a lot of us that doesn't register in our systems, because we know that if we had a family member or if we were sick, we would just walk up to triage or walk up to your colleague and say, hey, look, I think I have appendicitis. Can you, can you come and check me out? That's not what the rest of the world gets to deal with. That's not it, that we, they don't have that privilege. So we have to say, how can we make their stay more pleasant? And we all know those scenarios where you're just sitting in eMERGE and you go to see a patient in let's say room 14 and, and room 15 beside, you just know you're being watched like a tennis match back and forth because people are so desperately waiting for you to see them. And your commodity is so relevant to them. And you have to realize that. And you know they'll kind of crap on the nurses and do everything terrible to them because all they want is to see you and tell you why they're there at their most trying times. So how do you make that successful? I think one of the things I learned early on, and it probably is more relevant now, is patients don't care about your politics. I used to see people and they would complain about wait times and I would like, look, if you have a problem with wait times, you can write to your local MP. I, I, I kind of realized that that tactic wasn't overly helpful and patients didn't find that helpful when I was being trying to be resourceful and snarky at the same times. Patients don't care that there are waits. The average person just wants to be seen. They're not altruistic. They are not selfless. They want you to take their complaints seriously. They don't care that you just resuscitated a 20 year old and had a bad outcome. And that's one of the hardest things I find is how do you snap out of horrible case into minor complaint? And that's a really difficult challenge. And part of that snarkiness needs to be lost as you move from one complaint to the next. One of the things that people will say, and, and I think it's really important, is your first impression. Your first impression is really important. And, I, and I'm old fashioned. I, I mean, I, I certainly have worked with some colleagues who wear jeans and a hoodie, and I don't think that's appropriate. Um, whether you're a lab coat person, whether you're not, whether you're a scrubs person, but it, what we know from an American Medical Association survey is that just looking the part improves satisfaction scores. I mean, I was fortunate enough to take to work as was mentioned by Christine with Dr. Coombe. This is the, the perfect look. I mean, look at, he's wearing the same shoes that he wore when we were residents together. His scrubs are perfectly tailored and look at his attention to detail, looking up patient results online, certainly being there for patients. But whether you wear scrubs or not, people will judge you by how you dress. Whether that's right or wrong, it is what it is. So whether you want to get fig scrubs or LHSC scrubs, which were so coveted in my day, at the end of the day, is you want to look professional. You want to introduce yourself. Hello, my name is, and I don't care if you say David or doctor, you want people <laughs> to know your name. And you want to introduce yourself to everyone in the room. What's remarkable is how time, how often people have no idea who the emergency physician who sees them. And it's probably because we just rush that through. And 
what I used to say is, hey, my name is Dr. Carr, why are you here? No one wants to be talked like that, why are you here? That just starts off the relationship poorly. Hello, my name is Dr. Carr, how can I help you today? Or what brings you to the emergency department? So much more the open language really sets the tone and starting out wrong really sends you down the wrong path. I think it's also important to acknowledge that uh, people have waited a long time. So often I will say, thank you for your patience. Thank you for coming. And, and I will be more facetious and people I know who are really been troubling to the nurses, they're playing that tennis match, looking back and forth, because I know those people need to settle. And often you can settle them with just a acknowledging them and thanking them. And they're kind of like, oh, He's thanking me, that's fantastic. And then you've kind of fooled them into thinking you, you really care about them. And that's part of the game, right? As I always say, emergency medicine is show business for ugly people and you have to act and you have to show the part and show that you really care whether you believe it or not. Pre-COVID, I would say this is the most important thing. Now with COVID, we wanna get the heck out of the room at all times, but sitting down and talking to someone. If you sit, it is perceived that you spent double the amount of time in the patient-physician interaction than if you stand. So I will try to sit. I try not to kick out the 78-year-old Nona who's sitting and needs a chair, but I certainly will sit so that I could be at eye level to have that discussion, provided there's no infectious disease risk. I think that's an important way of making it seem that you stay longer and more importantly, connecting with people on an eye-to-eye -eye level. Now, if you haven't noticed already, or you don't know me, I'm certainly someone that you hear before you see. And I think one of the important things, and when I review patient complaints, it's a lot of he said, she said. You know, we work in tight spaces, and I don't know, because I, I mean, I worked at South Street in London, which was unbelievable to work at, and it was so hardcore, and I don't know with the new site what it's like but we tend to have patient areas that are not too far from where our working stations are. And often what would happen is you go see someone and then you come back, you're discussing the case with the resident and then someone else chimes in about something funny and you start laughing and then they make a patient complaint saying, Dr. Carr was discussing me and he was joking around with the residents and laughing about me and I felt very shamed. And I think you have to realize that it's broken telephone and that you have to be mindful about where you are in the department and you need to have that situational awareness because if you're near patients, you better shut up because they don't want to hear it. And obviously in really sensitive cases, certainly step really far away with your trainee so you can have sensitive conversations. I can't even tell you how many complaints come from that area. Now, Greg Henry, who's a famed eMERGE doc in London talks about the Disney World presented, sorry, not in London, in Detroit, just across the river. Um, and I love the Disney World principle. And the Disney World principle is such that when you go to Disney World and you take your family, you go and you line up and you go to Space Mountain and it says the lineup at Space Mountain from this point is two hours. And if you're crazy enough to wait, what you don't realize is that is a complete overestimation. So what happens is that you get on to Space Mountain an hour and 20 minutes and you're like, oh, this is fantastic. I thought I was gonna only wait two hours and I waited an hour 20. Wow, waiting's fantastic. And the way I do that in Emerge is I tell people, look, it's really difficult to get an ultrasound. It's really difficult to get an MRI. I'm gonna do my best. I'll see what I can do, but that ultrasound might take three to four hours. I just wanna set your expectations that MRI might take eight to 12 hours. And then fortuitously, when that ultrasound is called for in an hour, they think that you're magical. And I say, ah, they're taking you for ultrasound. And then they look at me, doc, that's amazing. I say, well, I guess I made a little call. And even if you didn't, even if it, you did, it makes it look like you helped. And people feel like they are winning even though they have it. And even though you have nothing to do with getting them an early ultrasound or an early MRI, but DI is quiet, they feel like you have advocated and people want to feel valued while they're in your department. Make a difference. Now, there are people who won't like you and there are people who will say, um, can I get your name? What's your name? And you, you know, kind of the badge checkers. My rule of thumb in patient complaints is the people who check your badge, 
tend to be really cluster B individuals, and they're actually not going to go through as much of the process to complain. They want to make you sweat. But I will say, when faced with a badge checker or faced with someone where you know the interaction hasn't gone as planned, write a novel, document, and document the complete interaction. And, and sometimes in parenthesis, you have to write things that aren't pleasant. If there were racist remarks, if there were sexist remarks, please use the language and quotations that they've used. You wanna color the chart to show exactly the type of individual that you were dealing with. Describe their character. That's helpful. But what's amazing is, you know, when I used to have people say, hey, Dave, I'm just giving you the, the preemptive awareness that I'm going to get a complaint from this family. It never comes. The complaints are the people who are passive aggressive and you had no idea. You caught them in a passive moment and they complain about you and you actually didn't think that it went so badly. And that's where you have to realize that all the rules of doing the right thing should be applied for everyone because it's not only the people with the um, squeaky wheels who need the grease. It's everyone. I think you have to realize when people leave, they go home. And I think you have to be mindful of what time of day it is. And I think you have to be aware of the fact that at night, if you send home an old person at three in the morning who doesn't have keys, they're going to have angry children. And angry children tend to be more angry than parents. So what I would say is make sure you have a cutoff or a safe time for people to leave the eMERGE and make sure you know what that is. And I wanna just tell you a story about a patient I saw. I saw a person who had been seen in our eMERGE. She had kind of right upper quadrant pain NYD. She had severe pain. She was given Toradol. She was given Dilaudid. She had an abdo, she had, sorry, a chest X-ray. She had a, a, a D-dimer, which was positive. She then went on to have a CTPE. She was given Dilaudid to go home. No one found an answer and she was coming in for a prescription renewal. So how does that make you feel? It's Friday, it's busy, you're at the Vic, you pick up this chart, and you probably are like, oh, second opinion, opioid prescription. I don't like either of those. So I went in with just the, hi, it's Dr. Carr, I understand you just want more opioids, or something snarky like that. I let my emotions start my interaction so poorly. And she, you could tell that she was just pissed. And I knew I was out of line. And I said, look, okay, let me start again. I'm really sorry. Let me step back. And I asked for a restart. Because sometimes you get off to the wrong, um, you're just not connecting with one another. And you say, you know what? It seems like you and I are, are argumentative. Why don't we try this again? And it's amazing how that works. And really what was happy and what was funny is I went to examine her with, I was going to get the ultrasound machine out to look at her right upper quadrant. And I realized she had shingles and no one had really looked at her skin. And here I felt like a complete ass having yelled at her for coming back when we had not really made the diagnosis. And uh, it's always fun when you make the diagnosis of shingles on POCUS, but hey, POCUS is great. Um, but Apologies go a long way. I'm really sorry that it started the way. I'm happy you came back and persevered. Obviously you knew something was wrong and it's really good you came here. It sounds like, you know, sometimes shingles presents late and I can give you a medication that might really help your pain. And problem, tragedy avoided because patient complaints are a nightmare. And, and one thing I will say about when you have a patient complaint is it's really important to have someone, whether it's your department chief or mentor, to really help you through the process. Because what you have to realize is that anything you write to a complaint in response really should be vetted and really should, if there's any medical legal risk, if there's a patient error, you have to really be careful of what you write because it can be subpoenaed against you. This is very different than he was not nice, she was not nice, in which case there's not going to be litigation. It may be college and you want to do everything to just make it go away. But we can talk about that when we go into the legal side of the talk, which we are um, in terms of where you want this to go. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that is why the nicest person and the nicest docs in your department don't get patient complaints. Because all it takes is one 
tone offside remark to really piss someone off. And especially in times like this, people have a short fuse, whether it's in the supermarket or here to complain. And the last thing you want is a complaint. And I get it. Things are stressful, but anything you can diffuse now is to your benefit. So I want to move on. And what I'm going to say is feel free at any time to interrupt or we can save a discussion to the end because I'm going to move more towards legal stuff. And I'm very happy Christine and Gory are going to do the chat and we can do some moderation. And, and I'm happy after I'm done for people to open up live. And there's also months have shared with me some great resources on the London site about some legal stuff and professionals and things that I think you'll also find helpful. Um, and I think this CMPA document about eMERGE work and remember, it used to be that the risk of being sued was about one in every seven years for emergency physician. Those numbers are clearly up now and I don't have them, but what we know is we have the highest um, malpractice rates of any non-surgeon. So I think this characterizes things. The bottom line is diagnostic error is an inherent risk of working in the ED. It arises from cognitive and system factors that are often intertwined. Fortunately, there are ways to mitigate medical legal risks from diagnostic error, such as recognizing your cognitive biases and documented your clinical thinking in the medical record. And I think that's a good statement to think about it. Now let's talk about where things go wrong. The first thing I would say where things go wrong for the nocturnists out there is that you have to realize that 63% of lawsuits arise from patients who are seen from 6 p.m. to 1 a.m. That's an alarming number. The second highest number is your overnight shifts. So if you're a nocturnist or someone who works late, you have to realize that resources are down, cr crowding is highest, failure is the most likely. So you have to see that perfect storm set up and be aware what you don't have. You have to also realize the temporal factors, which is, to the length of your shift corresponds to the likelihood of litigation. People who do 12 hour shifts are much more likely than people who do six. And furthermore, the person you see at, you know, your, you work the six to midnight shift, the person who you see at six, you may end up just doing a CT head, you may end up doing blood work, but the person you see at 1130 requires the exact same care. You know, yesterday I picked up a chart at the end of my shift hoping to help out. It was a person who had a post-op infection. I thought this would be simple. I could get the consulting service to come down. I kind of saw the person, ordered some blood work, ordered an x-ray. It was a thoracic patient. It's called thoracics. And then the thoracic surgery resident comes to me, Dave, the, the lactate's 8.1. And you're like, crap, uh, you know, I don't want to deal with this. I'm at the end of my shift. Maybe it's not for thoracics, but you owe them the same standard of care. And never in the minds of the judges or or plaintiff attorneys do they say ah you know you were at your end of your shift i could see how you would just want to do that quickly and, and don't worry about it that's totally kosher it's not the standard of care is not reflective of the length of your shift or where you're at in your shift so be mindful of your practice and don't shortcut patients who need workups just because you don't want to pass them on because that's not in the culture of the shop you work at 20% of physicians don't read the nurse's notes. I would say that there are so many litigations that I see that are successful based on things that are in EMS notes or nurse's notes. And sometimes EMS notes aren't readily available and I'm totally sensitive to that, but the nurse's notes are. Documentation of things like sudden onset of the worst headache of their life, um, severe pleuritic chest pain are things that need to be addressed. And I'm not saying that no what the nurse says that you should do what he does and therefore go down that pathway, but you must acknowledge that you've read it. You must acknowledge that you've looked at the vital signs that they've documented. If they have set this chart up to be a rule out subarachnoid by language such as sudden onset of the worst headache of their life, then you need to, if you're not going down the CT or LP route, then something along the lines of, you know, clarified statement on the nurse's note about sudden onset. Actually, this patient has this headache every day. It's no different than others. They actually said it didn't happen. You know, definitely go there, address that. You can't leave it blank. And I'll tell you a crazy case, and this is a really difficult case, which was a person who had cellulitis. And they were on antibiotics, they were 88 years old, and they were coming back every day for cellulitis rechecks. And on the nurse's note, it said, day seven of IV antibiotics, much better um, for final check 
of note, patient has diarrhea times five. So the eMERGE doc picked up the chart. It says uh, for treat and release or something along those lines, went in the room and said, how's your leg? Looks great, perfect, excellent. You can stop the IV. You know what? I don't even think you need PO, everything's great. Unfortunately, it was never acknowledged the diarrhea times five. And this woman ended up having C. diff and ended up dying. And, you know, you have to address every complaint. Everything in the triage note has to be addressed. Everything in the nurse's note has to be addressed how you see it relevant to the case. And omitting something where, you know, if the nurse says someone has double vision and a headache and you see them with vertigo, it's very difficult to defend them if they have BPV and you haven't addressed the fact that diplopia was mentioned and maybe you need further testing. So please read the nurse's note because 80% of the time you don't, or you do, and you miss that 20%. Vital signs. You know, I, I think we, one of the things we have this, uh, created this quality assurance project in our group. And one of the things that was identified was abnormal vital signs seem to be a pick for predicting medical legal error and bounce back. And one of the things that came up on the face sheet and we're still paper charted at UHN is that there was something that showed up as abnormal vitals were flagged on the front page. And if that's flagged, then it says abnormal vitals checked prior to discharge. So it was kind of put towards the nursing staff to check that or for the physicians to know that. And we all know those patients who come in tachycardic. And if you're tall like me, um, you can kind of look over the curtain when you're they're sleeping and note, note their heart rate to be 76 and then send them home or maybe 92. But the key is you can't send home people with heart rates of 120, not because that's bad, but because you're probably missing something that needs to be addressed in most of the time. So when you see abnormal vitals and when, you know, when people come in with abnormal vitals, maybe in the setting of fever or SIRS criteria, what I'm always looking at is, okay, I understand they came in at 120 with a temp of 39, but you know, the doctor rechecked them, they gave them some fluids, the temp came to 37, the heart rate came to 70, the blood pressure was 130 over 80. I mean, certainly they uh, vitalized and stabilized and, and you're mindful of the fact that that was in the physician's mindset when they were looking at it. So please recheck abnormal vitals. Those are your clues. Charts. Now I understand at LHSC, some of you are still using paper charts. I am using paper charts. The chart is the holy grail. And I can't even tell you how often it, you know, I will see this. And it's terrible when you see this, because if you are someone who's a late documenter, you don't bring the chart into the room, maybe with COVID, you don't want to bring anything into the room, then you're screwed. You're fucked. Because you, if you write, don't write things down, it's not on the chart. If you have a blank chart, how can I defend you? If you have a chart that is very, has very scant information, how can I defend you? You know, plain, defendant lawyers will always tell eMERGE physicians to say, well, it's my standard practice of someone to come in with a headache to do a full neuro exam, a full HINTS exam, a full cerebellar testing. And I'll just say, but you didn't do it. It's not documented. You documented your abdominal exam or you didn't even document an exam. If it's not documented, you didn't do it. And you have to realize that mantra. And I think as we move towards electronic medical records or EPIC and people have macros or stuff like that, um, again, we can discuss that as a whole in the question period if people want, but you want to show that you've examined the person. And if you are writing, I think it's pretty well understood that for some reason, if your handwriting's messy like mine, that it is perceived that messy handwriting equals sloppy care. Whether that's right or not, it's not. But if I have a doctor and I have to have them transcribe their note and they say, well, I don't know what I wrote there and I'm not sure what that is, it, it just speaks to the nature of the charting and documentation. It's why Epic will be, or whatever you choose will be a good thing. Cause my handwriting is much better when I dictate. And I think that's important. And it tells a story. And one of the reasons I like dictating is I can provide a patient narrative. The patient has a chest pain. There is a pleuritic component, but they've had this for six years. There's nothing that really changes. I didn't find the need to do a CT. They're perk negative. They have no risk. And despite them being sent here for a referral to rule out a PE, I don't feel that this is appropriate based on X, Y, Z. If you have to handwrite that, you tend to be lazy. And you can't be lazy in charting. And I don't want to Americanize medical legal risk. But at the end of the day, as we've moved away where litigation is becoming a much 
more busy job. In fact, my medical legal practice is really about a third of my line of clinical work and it takes a lot of time and there's a lot of litigation. So be careful. Know who you're getting advice from. I think this is a really important thing. All of us are currently working in an academic institution. Some of you residents will go on to work in community sites. Some of you will work on to, into academic sites, but you have to realize who's answering your page and you want to document, you know, and clearly if you spoke to a PGY2 and surgery covering urology, who's telling you to send home a person with a fever or white count of 25 with a stone and just give them Cipro, that may not be good advice. Now, if you're speaking to a staff who says the same thing, that is also not good advice, but you have to know who you're speaking to because there's a higher standard amongst the accepting physicians and staff than there are residents. And you have to realize that when you're talking to people. I know I've had cases where, you know, I have in the middle of the night, someone with abdo pain, you do a pocus, they have a AAA, they're a little hypotensive, they're shocky, you don't know if there's a rupture and you call radiology and, and you do that CT and they say, well, you know, he does have a AAA, there's some clot in there. It's hard to say if that's new or old, if he's ruptured or not. And it's like, well, can I ask, and I don't mean this with any disrespect, what year are you? And he will say, or she will say, well, I'm a two. And I, I'm not being a jerk about it, but you know, maybe given the brevity of this case, given that I'm worried about a rupture AAA, maybe we could discuss this with your fellow or your staff. And if you're uncomfortable, I'm happy to call as well. Because you, there are certain things that you can't rely on. And for life-threatening things, you have to realize that you're speaking to a resident and if they're junior or not comfortable, you have to advocate for your patients. You have to know the importance of ordering the right test. And if you don't order the right test, you can't use it to falsely reassure. I think it's important to know what tests you need. And I use the sort of criteria such as no CT had as per Canadian CT rules, no C-spine x-ray as per Canadian C-spine rules. So I use validated standard practice, standard of care tools to decide imaging tests. Now I'm gonna ask you a question and this is kind of awkward because at the end of the day is, I'm gonna ask you to do this on your own time. So what I want everyone to do, and I can see you, you have to realize this, is I want you to put up your hand if you work in a center that has a CT. Okay, I see it. You all have a CT. So what this means is that every one of you has a CT, and if a patient needs a CT to rule out a dissection or to rule out something scary, it needs to be ordered at night. You know, one of the things that comes up time and time again, you know, you see these people with chest pain and they're getting morphine, they're waiting for a CT and they're getting morphine and morphine, maybe it's a PE, you know, apart from the fact that PEs don't get opioids, you know, one of the things that comes up is radiologists will say, you know, they never called. If, if they wanted a CT dissection study, I would have done it, but they never asked. They're not going to be your friends. You have to call and document. I had this great case where I had this person with angst spawned who had a neck injury and started to have numbness and weakness in her legs. And the emergency doctor saw her and said, I spoke to neurology. I spoke to radiology. They, neither of them are able to add to allow for an MR of the spine at night. I have told them that I'm worried that the CT spine is not an appropriate test. Given the new neurological findings, an MRI is prudent. I spoke to the radiologist on call. I also spoke to the neurologist on call um, and both feel that this can wait to the morning. And this person had a bad outcome. But when I reviewed the file, I can say the eMERGE doc did everything that she could do to advocate. She spoke to a staff. And I want to tell you a phrase that I love, and I want you to keep it in your back pocket. And it's something that I think you have to realize that it's important, but don't use it every day. Don't use it every year. But when faced with difficult discussions with radiologists, and, and dissection is my clinical interest, so it's one of those that I love, is that when it comes up that you have a dissection rule out, and you're having a challenge with the radiologist and they don't want to do the study and it's one in the morning, you're at a community site and they have to call in to a tech. I want you to write down this phrase or memorize it. I am sure you understand the implications of both of us missing this diagnosis. I will say it again. I am sure you understand the implications of both of us 
missing this diagnosis. There is no doubt we both need to do that CT to rule out a dissection that this could be life-threatening. I'm telling you for my N of maybe three or four, it's 100% accurate in getting the test that you want. Once you bring the radiologist into the circle of care from the circle of death, you can then move forward. They will not reject you if put like that because then they are part of the treating team. Involve them. Don't use it threatening. Use it when you need to. I want to leave you with about 10 high-risk scenarios that I think you need to know about. I think these are important. One of my buddies, uh, Mike Weinstock, writes a book called Bounce Backs. I think one of the hard parts about bounce backs is that sometimes you're biased in, you know, that person was seen by Mike Lowell or Amit Shah or, you know, Lori Teeple or some excellent doctor. I'm sure they were right. And then you want to discount the patient. What you have to realize is that a bounce back is a fresh canvas. It's an opportunity for you to make a diagnosis that someone else didn't. You have to put away your inherent bias of who saw them first and then pretest what the likelihood that they missed something. You can certainly look up the patient's history and previous visits to get a sense of who they are, but look at it like when I saw the person who had right upper quadrant pain who had shingles, despite a positive D-dimer, um, a negative chest x-ray, a negative CTPE, sometimes patients evolve and your visit's going to be different with the last one and you will get more information. So make the right diagnosis and realize that with bounce backs, it's a setup for a medical legal mistake. So when a person who you get the sense that they are not complaining, that they're not difficult, please start fresh. Return visits, you know, we bring people back for return visits often. And, and sometimes you have to realize that there are things that you can just overlook. I remember about a year ago, I had, or two years ago, pre-COVID, I had someone come back for a Doppler and had a Doppler to rule out a DVT. And uh, they came in and, you know, you pick up the charts, the easiest one, because the, you know, the ultrasound results are already there and it says no DVT. So I go in the room, I said, hey, look, you don't have a DVT. I'm not sure why your leg hurts, but I'm thrilled your DVT studies negative. All the best, best of luck on your journey. And the patient looks at me and he says, well, what about this chest pain that I have every time I breathe? <laughs> and you're like, uh, what did you say? And sure enough, that person had a, a PE. And, you know, that was on the chart yesterday that they had chest pain, but because they had some leg pain, the doc thought I would do an ultrasound first, but that wasn't communicated to me. So when you bring people back for return visits, whether it's antibiotics, whether it's imaging, make sure that you have some tool that allows the doc inheriting the patient to therefore know what to expect the courses. If ultrasound negative considered CT, given the fact that the dimer was positive and the, or the fact that they still have chest pain and it won't be accounted for based on a negative Doppler. You know, you have to be mindful, read the note from the day before and as colleagues have some sort of form that helps transition the care from one to two. Lamas, you're left against medical advice are very high risk people. You have to document the crap out of your llamas. You know, I had this great case, another sad case, 48 year old guy seen in the eMERGE three days ago, chest pain, so, so story, no cardiac risk factors apart from smoking, does the troponin dance, they're both negative, ECG times two normal, goes home, outpatient follow-up arranged. Excellent care by eMERGE doc number one. Patient comes in three days later, says, hey, look, I'm at the bank across the street from the Western, got this episode of chest pain. It seemed like yesterday, maybe I'm anxious. Emerged nurse does an ECG and patient says, you know what, the, I, I had this again, maybe I'm just anxious. And the eMERGE doc is asked to see them because they wanna go home. And the eMERGE doc kind of sees them and says, patient wants to leave against medical advice. Okay, patient left. What wasn't realized is that the ECG that was done prior was different than the one from two days ago. So by the time this person came with their second visit, they had T-wave inversions in all their precordial leads that they had flipped. And this person had a massive cardiac arrest about four hours later and died. It's not defensible. You can let people leave. When you're faced with a situation where you know someone's leaving and they have serious pathology, so it's not uncommon. Like I've had STEMIs who've left, 
this is where you really have to document patient capable. I've offered to call the patient's family doctor. I've offered to call a relative. Patient is aware that they will die if they leave. And I use that word. They will die if they leave. This is a life-threatening condition. Patient is not suffering from a mental health issue that is, is um, predisposing them for leaving. I mean, people always want to leave because of cats. I've never understood that. I have to feed my cat is a common reason why people leave. I don't know why that always comes up, but you better document. And even on the chart, you know, a patient can come back at any time for their thrombolytic or for their calf, you know, involve specialists, get as many people, advocate for the people who you really think don't want to leave. And then the people who you're thrilled to leave, just write a note and get them out of the department. Your frequent flyers, what I'll tell you about them is unfortunately, every time they will eventually die. And you just hope it's not on your Shift. We have a frequent flyer who always pretends that he or she is paralyzed when they come to the eMERGE, creates a scene in the waiting room to patients in the waiting room that don't know him. Um, they think something's crazy. They're all screaming. You got to help this person. We kind of have a rule that you don't see this person in the, in the main eMERGE. You keep them outside. I'm sure you have someone like this. One of our docs, one of my colleagues actually diagnosed a STEMI on him. And I remember saying, how did you diagnose a STEMI on this person? Like he has nothing always. And he said, he walked up to me and said, I always come in and I'm paralyzed. I actually have chest pain. I never get chest pain. I promise you, I'm not faking it. And that was a nice clue. And he said, I'm not so smart, but the reality is your frequent flyers eventually will have something and the chart and you have to look at it and you get to know these people is, is this different from their baseline visits? You know what they come in, they want cogentin. This is a little different. Maybe I need to deal with that. They all will die at some point. Your drunks. What I will say is you need to have a department with your drunks or your withdrawal patient about who's safe to go home. We all know these people want to leave and the nurses and the docs, none of us want these people in the department. So the reality is we all have this incentive to get rid of these people, but the problem is they tend not to be stable and they tend to fall. And I was involved in a case where a patient left the department and they got hit by a car and they used the departmental footage to show that this person was unstable walking. They were, they on the way out of the department had fallen and they were holding on to the desk walking out. Well, how do you say gait is stable in someone who's fallen on the way out? You're responsible for that person. That person's not capable to leave when they're intoxicated and a risk to themselves. So you need to go there and you need to deal with that. You, these footages will sink you time and time again. Handover, have a structured handover approach so that you have a plan for doc two from doc one. If trope normal can come home, but have things set up, make sure there's good communication tools. We have a handover form that goes over the first two docs so that there's no gaps. These are high risk situations. People who don't speak your language have a language line. I think one of the hardest things is we have to stop using like six-year-old grandchildren as, as um, interpreters and translation services, have, a, have an approach. It's always curious when you, you ask a question to the interpreter, they have like a 25 minute discussion with the patient and then they come back and say, uh, he said no. And you're like, well, what about all that other gestalt, right? You don't get the full sense. So really try to involve other people. And probably now more than ever in the setting of COVID where we don't have visitors, I feel crippled by not having family members there in the room as advocates. So look, I tend to over order on patients because I just don't feel the gestalt of them the way I can in my mother tongue. These people aren't your friends. 25% uh, of their abdo pain is surgical. They look cute and cuddly, but they have problems. Be mindful of them. They all go south. Think about high risk conditions. Um, I've been involved in obviously um, a few spleen cases where splenectomized individuals have turned septic south. Um, I document that every chest pain like Isaiah Austin doesn't have Marfans because obviously that's a high risk thing and patients often don't tell you they have Marfans. They sometimes don't know it when they come in when they're 19 years old and they are as tall as me, but they weigh about 40. You have to be aware of what that looks like. Your transplant patients, your mechanical valves, know the high risk conditions and know the high risk complaint of pain out of proportion. You know, there's not a lot of things that cause that. And unfortunately, some of these patients who have things like neck 
neck fascia or compartment syndromes can be difficult to begin with based on socioeconomic circumstances or people who maybe have a history of uh, IV drug use or something. But you know, if the nurse writes screaming on the floor, rolling in pain, 10 out of 10 pain, well, you know what, you better make sure if you're sending that person home that you've thought about the severe 10 out of 10 pains, the torsions, the compartments, the neck fash and other things. I think we can't give a lecture during COVID without talking about what COVID means. I don't know where the net, what the next week holds. I don't know if we'll redeploy, but I've already had three cases that have arisen during COVID. I think we have a tendency to COVIDize the crap out of things. You know, we had a missed endocarditis. You know, I've seen a missed appendicitis that came in with headache, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Uh, Merge doc did a COVID swab and sent home. They came back with right lower quantum pain and the abdominal exam was not done. They had a perfect appendix. So please, you do have to examine. I think that, uh, you know, everyone will forget the acuity of the moment. But what I want you to do in scenarios if we move to disaster is contextualize the situation. So in the event that you're an eMERGE doc covering the ICU or you're an eMERGE doc seeing a patient in a tent outside uh, LHSC, University Hospital, because there's no rooms, then say, I am seeing this person in a chair outside as there are no beds in the apartment from my exam this. You know, I think the judiciary will be forgiving about this time, but you have to contextualize it. So if you're going to be covering an area, and I, I've told this to people who are like surgeons working in the ICU, this there is no standard of care for an eMERGE doc who works in the ICU who's not an intensivist. You're doing the best you can, and just note that in your chart. So in final, some final tips upon discharge. Please make sure that your patients get home safely. Uh, please make sure that patients who seize, please make sure that patients who have cardiac syncope are, it is documented that they're not safe to drive home and that administrative transportation form has been filled. I have certainly been involved in several cases where patients have driven and they were not told not to drive or not inquired about a driver's license. That is on your shoulders if they go home and have an accident. Please make sure you're aware of the follow-up in your community. Now you might be very blessed to have great follow-up with ophthalmology or plastics or ortho working in your academic ivory tower, but maybe if you're working in another community hospital, maybe it's uh, seven to 10 days for something that with that iritis you don't want to be seen. So it is an expectation of the courts that you have a sense of what is appropriate follow-up. And for me, when I see surgical fractures, I call the orthopedic surgeon and I say, hey, look, I got a bad tip fib. I know you guys are swamped. Do you want me to reduce and cast? It's already been done. Or is this someone you should you want to see to admit for an OR? And they say, Dave, thanks for calling. You know, our board's nuts why don't you just send them home? I took the MRN, I'll call them, we'll get them on the board this week. But I have that discussion because if ever something goes sour, you know, the surgeon's not gonna say, well, hey, look, if he had called me with that tip fib, I would have come down and see the patient. It's terrible that they had a compartment syndrome and I didn't even know about it. So make those phone calls. Be aware that any abnormal labs need to be followed up. To that 50 year old, male who comes into your department with some non-significant complaint who has a hemoglobin of 117 and you're sending home, you must write on the chart. Patient is aware hemoglobin of 117, is aware that it's likely not related to the visit. I've attached the blood work for the patient to have. They will follow up with family doctor, may benefit from a colonoscopy. Someone has a white count that's low. Patient will have a repeat CBC to make sure their cell lines are normal or an HIV test if it's appropriate. But there are, when you see red on your lab results, there are things that are gonna need follow up and it's okay to punt that off to someone else. But I write things like, I've notified the patient, there's an informed consent, an informed discharge process, and I tell them what to do. And I think when you give discharge instructions, that's something you really have to do is to have an informed discharge, to say, here's what you need to do and that the patient is aware. So what can I tell you in following up? I think I took a bit more time than I was expecting, um, is that you really need to make an entrance. People will remember how you greeted them, how you told them your name, how you looked, how you sat down, 
how you address them, how you acknowledge them, how you thank them, how you told them what their day is going to be like. You'll probably be here about an hour for that blood work and I'll get a, a sense of where things are at. That the chart is the holy grail. If you didn't write it down, you didn't do it. You're not going to remember this lawsuit in 18 months when you're served. So I can't rely on your evidence to say, I, I always do this. It has to be more than that. Know the high risk situations, your bounce backs, your flyers, your llamas. Know the high risk patients, your spleens, your transplants, your pain out of proportions. Know how to advocate for people. Call consultants. Know the line. I am sure you understand the implications of both of us seeing this patient. Maybe you need to discuss this case with your fellow or staff. Make sure you send people home and make sure you send them home on a correct path. I need you to go see someone. I'm gonna arrange follow-up. Here's the phone number in case you don't get it. And remember, if you've ever been on the other side of the curtain, remember how much you wanna know when your CT's read, when your blood works back, and give patients the same privilege to tell them, hey, look, Blood work looks good. I'm just waiting on one test. Give them those updates. They're just yearning for reassurance. So see their movies. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carr, for that uh, really informative talk. I, I think you brought up a whole lot of fantastic points. And you know, for those of us who have been doing this for a long time, it's a great reminder of things that we are doing well. And also of things that you know we could all think about and perhaps make some changes to our practice. Um, definitely, some points came up on the chat group, so I'm going to kind of start with that. If you're okay with that, please, yeah. Okay. Um, so one of them is just uh, a, a reminder from um, from Munsif, similar to what you said. Patients hear everything. So the way our setup is, we're um, very sent. We're we're in the middle of the room and. Uh, Patients can hear everything that we say. They can often see what, well, they do. They see what we're doing. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, trying to take residents to another area to chat about a patient? Uh, if there's something that may be hurtful to the patient to hear. For sure. And I think that's a really good point, Munsif, in terms of uh, obviously being mindful of your surrounding and having that awareness. But there are certain discussions that are best kept from a distance. And obviously the person who uh, sprains her ankle and uh, rolls it is a lot less of a sensitive issue than many scenarios that we can think about. So have your senses telling you if you think it's best to bring the resident or best for you to discuss the case with a consultant distanced from that area, because that is a major area. And I think we all can predict, and we all have been doing this for a long time. What are sensitive situations? You know what? I'm not going to discuss this here. There are major social issues that a patient may find this embarrassing to be discussed. And it's terrible if you think about it. You know, sometimes you go see a patient in room 4A and they're in 4B and they're separated by a curtain and you're taking a full sexual history in 4A and you're like, this is ridiculous that we do this. And a lot of patients have their pride lost when they come here. And I think we want to avoid these things and put patients in the appropriate rooms to begin with, to start with. Okay, that's great. Um, one of my uh, colleagues said, uh, just wondering your thoughts about documenting things that could perhaps be interpreted as insulting to patients on official documentation. For example, malodorous, disheveled, ornery. I do like the ornery. Um, and how could that affect things or reflect on the writer if there's any kind of legal proceedings or review? Yeah, so remember that patients own the medical records. So you certainly don't want to write things that, you know, one of the things we have at UHN is this patient portal. And uh, at McKenzie Health, where I work, people have access to their charts and you better be careful what you write. Um, if you're going to choose to write things that are negative, it has to be in the context of your, as I described, if you have someone who's very rude or dis, you know, you're worried about a complaint or you want to document their treatment or behavior in the emerge, that's appointment. But I think you can say things like you're obese. Like, I mean, it is what it is. Like, and, and you can say things like that, you know, the wound was malodorous or patient was poorly kept. 
those are probably within the realm of what medically people would use to describe people. But there are other things that can be very, you know, you would never, you know, in the old days, we used to say FLKs. I remember funny looking kids was something when, for those of us who trade, obviously no one says that anymore. Um, you would never write, I saw an FLK, you just wouldn't do that. But there are things you can write that, um, you know, dysmorphic figures, um, you know, un unsure about the significance or things like that. So um, recently we've been switching to online documentation. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I'd say maybe there's a quarter of us in the group that are, are using a system called Dynadoc. Um, and it's, uh, I, I think it's, it's a, gonna be a great system for better documentation. We have a choice of using some uh, presets or drop down boxes. I just tend to type my thoughts as I go through similar to as I would write a chart and some of our staff are dictating into their iPhone having it uh, go over. Um, I, I think it's slowing us down right now, but uh, what are your thoughts on, on uh, these changes? Look, I, I think they're wonderful. I, 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 like I use a dragon dictation system. And what I will say is, as I say, being able to speak a narrative, people don't chart lazily. What I am bothered by, and I think sometimes you see these macros where it's like insert macro and it pulls this ridiculous 400 page note, which it's very clear that no one did any of that exam. You have to be a careful. And if your macro is, um, you know, if a patient gets a copy of that medical record and says, you know, it says here that he did this, this and this, he didn't even examine my belly. I think you need to be careful. So look, everyone has to do what they're comfortable. I think there's roles for macro in your electronic uh, record and dictation. I tend to do blank note and I, I freestyle my note. And then I might insert some things like my discharge instructions. I might pick in some of the lab values or imaging, but I, what I'm careful about is not, you know, you just have to be careful that someone's gonna read it. So if you're gonna say you did all these things for everyone, it may be that you don't. And especially during COVID when our physical exams are limited, be careful what you're documenting you did. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I would echo that. So, so I actually do peer assessments for uh, the CPSO, which means I get to review physician charts and some are fantastic, some are horrendous. But some of the things that I think are not well done in general are making some sort of comment on your interpretation of ECGs, imaging um, and abnormal lab values. So somehow acknowledging that you've actually seen them and, and made an interpretation and discharge instructions are invariably poorly done. And that's probably one of the most important things that can protect us medically legally. Mm -hmm. The one, and one I, last, I, yeah. I was sorry, I will say, Christina, if your group, and I know at, at, at our hospitals that we have this thing where we have to um, sign every ECG <laughs> and it's a high risk thing. If you sign the ECG and you know, this patient's in the waiting room, you know, unless you have to actually take a look and, and, and I write things like concerning ECG needs a bed, concerning ECG does serial. They will, the, whoever shows you that ECG will write ECG shown to Dr. Richardson. So if there's a STEMI or if there's, you know, a STEMI equivalent, like a De Winter or something, you better make sure that you have put that path person the right journey as opposed to keeping them in the waiting room for five more hours. Yeah, agreed. And, and, and they definitely document, uh, doctor is aware, anything. Yes. Um, one, one more, I think, really good question. And I know we're hitting the end of time. I hope people can hang on a little bit longer. Um, but uh, Justin Yancet asked, if you can comment on the recent CMP article regarding our duty of care for patients in ambulant offload delay, because that's yeah. a unique class. Yeah, I saw that. And I think now more than ever is there is a, a standard of care when you're involved in that care. I mean, once uh, someone has brought you to be aware of this, you know, when I'm involved in cases of someone who has care, you know, when it's documented that the patient has a blood pressure of 60 over 40, and maybe they've been there for four hours, what I would say, Justin, is when you get involved, and sometimes you're involved way too late, because you found out the trope is 3000 or the lactate's nine, just document, I was made aware of the troponin now at 1230, I immediately brought the person into a red zone right after I found out this result. Um, I've immediately called cardiology because what you want to do is talk about when your involvement started. But if your involvement started four hours ago and you were handed an ECG and you missed something, then you're kind of in trouble. 
but I don't know if that answered your question, but please yeah. contextualize the situation to say when you got involved, because it looks much worse than it was. And you're just an innocent bystander, I'm going to yeah. imagine. Thank, thanks for that, David. I guess my concern, if like you read the article, the it was an ambulance offload delay situation specifically where the ECG was handed to the physician. And there were some changes. It wasn't a STEMI necessarily, but then they got called away to stat to a recess room to resuscitate someone. There wasn't a bed available for three hours. The physician didn't see the patient until four hours after their visit. And then it wasn't like a STEMI shown on an ECG until like 90 minutes after that. And I think my biggest concern, you know, despite the ED physician saying, you know, they circled an area of concern and said they need ECGs every 15 minutes, first available monitored bed or what have you was that the college is, it says in the summary case anyway, that the college was critical of the physician for not assessing the patient earlier in person when there was no bed available, unfortunately, or alternatively, the physician physician could have seen the patient in the hallway and not waited for an ED bed or um, just asked for more detailed updates from the nursing staff. So I, I guess the article just goes on to, to summarize that the duty, the duty of care may be established at the time the ECG is handed to the physician um, when, the system doesn't allow us to properly assess the patient. Like, I don't know, like, I'm not sure that I would be willing or would want to assess someone in the hallway who's got ECG changes. I would be insisting that the first available monitor bed be made available. But if that's still three hours in the making, that's, that's really outside of our control. So uh, all of my colleagues were in uproar of this too. I think the college and the CMPA are different bodies. I, I think what you have to do is document. I think if there's a concerning story that's brought to your attention, you do need to advocate. And sometimes I do on high risk say this patient needs a bed. This patient needs a bed in the department. Please, you know, please arrange for immediate bed. And then you punt that responsibility to someone else. And you say, I'd like, you know, but if there's no bed and you have someone with something very sinister, the standard will be that you acted accordingly. And, and I think in wartime measures, just contextualize the situation. That's all you can do. But I hear you. And I was bothered by that as well.